As a non-American person, why you started the school as the American International School? And then at which point did you adopt the IB program? Okay. Um, well, finding a name for the school was one of the things that we, uh, in a, initially, we, this, the group of five of us who, who together set up the school, finding a name was something we, we spent many hours talking about. And we went through a whole gamut of names, trying to find a name that... The, the name we would really have liked would have been the London International School. But the International School of London already existed, and we felt that was likely to cause conflict. Um, the majority of our students, uh, because of those of us who set up the school, they all come from ACS, an American Community School. The majority of the students who were likely to be either Americans or people who intended to go on to the US for their higher education. In fact, for the first year, uh, the biggest single group of students we had were Iranian. Um, and that was just the time of the Iranian Revolution. Uh, and a number of Iranians uh, were, you might say, using London as a stepping stone to, to the USA. So it was true that initially most of our students were either American or wanted to be, be American, as it were. Um, but that uh, soon proved to be false, because uh, we, had, we had students from all over the, the world. And as we, uh, we started developing quite a large Scandinavian section, large is a relative term because we never had huge numbers, but quite a large number of students were from the Scandinavian countries. And they weren't interested in going on to the USA and they weren't interested in Britain either. They were intending to go back to their own countries. Um, when I'd been head of the school in Geneva, uh, I was quite heavily involved with the IB at that stage because we, we offered the IB as uh, our own program. And uh, with this change in the profile of the school, uh, it seemed an actual thing that the school should uh, recognize that it was international and not American. And so the term South Bank was adopted, I think, in the school's first or second year, if I can remember, I think. I think it may have been the second year. Um, and we used to call it South Bank Dash, the American International School. Um, when we, st we started the IB in the school's third or fourth year, by then we'd left Waterloo and we were located in Eccleston Square in Pimlico. Um, when we adopted the IB, uh, we started calling it South Bank AIS, and eventually we dropped the AIS because the, it became meaningless, really. Uh, there was quite a lot of fear that by dropping the word American, we would actually lose a lot of uh, students. But uh, that proved to be wrong, because as soon as we dropped the word American, <coughs> We seem to have an influx of Americans <laughs> into the school. Has there been, ever been any discussion about expanding South Bank to other big cities around the world? I mean, it's such a unique school. I mean, and then I, at some point, we will probably be leaving here. And I would love to my kids in another South Bank in New York yes. City. Um, did you ever talk about that? Or? Yes. Uh, we, when I was here, we, we did occasionally have discussions about uh, expanding expanding abroad. I mean, they, we had uh, been approached uh, a couple, by a couple of countries as to whether, from a couple of countries, not by the countries themselves, but uh, from a couple, to see whether we would set up something in them. Malaysia was one of them, the countries. Uh, my own feeling at the time, uh, perhaps it was, it was that we had enough on our plate trying to, to run this, this school. 
and I didn't want to divert you know, our concentration to other places. I think there have been one or two schools that have, well, certainly know of one that, that arose out of South Bank. I think it's became a somewhat different school, but nevertheless, it started off trying to run on similar lines. And that was a school in Norway, um, because the founding head of that school had been a teacher here. And she uh, set up a school in, um, I think it's called Skagara. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's become a highly successful school, but it's very much more structured than we were at the time. Uh, there was a school set up in New York uh, following the Philadelphia project. It was called City as School, hyphenated City as School. That was run by the, um, uh, by the City of New York, and it was a public school. Uh, but I don't know whether it still exists or not. I talked about making a difference and an unexecuted idea being the same as in action, having the same outcome. So when and how did you start instilling this um, idea of service in your students? And how, as, as a school community, can we continue that with our own students? I mean, I know that we have as the PT has been working with the school and with the faculty to help keep this, foster this idea of service. But I'd like to get your, your viewpoint on it and how you start, began that. I'm not sure how to began that, to be honest. I, I, I can't actually, I'm claiming uh, this is my age maybe, but <laughs> <laughs> I can't actually recall how we ever began it. But it always seemed to be part of what we were doing, and as part of our expectations was that students uh, and the school, uh, not just students, but the school as a whole, should always be looking to, to find opportunities to serve the wider community, uh, not just the, the local community, but uh, the uh, community of other countries. It seemed to be a natural thing. Uh, but with an international school, one would definitely be looking around the world for, for opportunities to, to assist. Um, I think, of course, once we adopted the IB, uh, that actually became not simply an aspiration, but became a requirement of the, the program that we are expected uh, within the IB program. Uh, to be taking action to help others. Um, the school has had invested quite a lot by, for example, uh, making sure at the, at the uh, diploma level or at the high school level uh, that a specific member of staff was appointed to oversee this. Uh, Phil Clancy's, some of you know, Phil's ever spoken to the student. Yes. But uh, she has developed, uh, I think, an amazing uh, action program for, uh, uh, for an inner city school. And of course the involvement of South Bank with, for example, the, uh, the school for blind children in Tanzania uh, is, is quite remarkable, I think. I don't know if so we saw the the uh, picture on the website of a street that's been named South Bank International School Road <laughs> in Tanzania. Um, so I, I don't know how we started that, but I think it's just always been part of the ethos. It's something that teachers talk up, that, uh, that uh, parents, by their own example, by the way the school is uh, has been involved, for example, in the uh, tsunami, uh, the work in, in, in uh, Sri Lanka and so on. I think things like that, um, by setting this example, it becomes part of the, the ethos of, of the school. Well, thank you very much, Milton, for coming. Thank you.